everybody, Germ here, and Mentally Diseased is now a tabloid network. This just in, many people who were raised as Jehovah's Witnesses or even converted later on in life are leaving the religion to pursue careers that actually pay them. Some are seeing enormous success in doing so. The following is by no means a comprehensive list. In the interest of time and, well, milking these rich celebrities for all the content they're worth, here are 10 celebrity ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and what they've said about their experience with the religion. We're brothers. We're happy and we're singing and we're colored. Give me a high five. All right, cut and print. Beautiful guys. Dynamite. The Waynes family are a prolific American show business family whose work include comedic hits like the Scary Movie series, White Chicks, and The Waynes Brothers. Father to the family, Howell Waynes, was a devout Jehovah's Witness and raised all 10 children in the faith. Damon Waynes has said, My father is a Jehovah's Witness and he raised us under a very strict hand. He believed that if he did not spare the rod, he would raise functional, obedient children. He failed to realize he didn't need to beat us all the time, he needed to talk to us, to try to understand us. Their mother, in contrast, did not take up the faith and was critical of religion. In an interview with Westward, Keenan Wayne said, I don't think religion has as much impact on me because my mom was not a Jehovah's Witness, and she would point out all of the funny and contradictory things about religion. So we had a unique side-eye view on religion. My dad was the Jehovah's Witness. My mom was not, and there was always conflict about that. In an interview promoting A Haunted House, Marlon Wayne spoke about how his witness upbringing has influenced how his family celebrates Halloween now. Hey, my dad was a Jehovah Witness, so he didn't play that shit. Yeah, he wasn't playing. He felt like that was the devil's holiday. In a way, he was kind of right. Halloween is like a pedophile's homecoming. <laughs> a pedophile is like, oh, look at all them babies coming to get some sugar today. <laughs> There's so much evil shit that happens on Halloween. People put raisins in apples, and honestly, we were so poor, I would have taken a razor apple. None of us are big on Halloween. My dad killed that holiday, but my kids celebrate it. I let them dress up and stuff. I even let them go out and beg for candy. I don't let them eat it, though. <laughs> that pisses them off. I tell them, I buy them their own candy. <laughs> Certainly a hot take. Most of the siblings are inactive now, but Damon Wayne still practices. He took a selfie with his family at the 2017 Jehovah's Witness Memorial Service and attended one of their annual meetings. He also saw some drama during the filming of the Lethal Weapon TV show when he refused to shoot in a church because it's against his religion to enter another house of worship. He further demonstrated good Christian values in a conflict with his co-star on the set. You know, I've seen handle hits better than you did yesterday. Suck me. I mean, that was the biggest nerve I think I've yeah, ever seen. You're the biggest crybaby I've ever met in my life. Yeah, come on, suck this. I mean, how does it feel to only be in the game because you're. Ah, uh, what it must be like to be a wealthy Jehovah's Witness. Jerry Halliwell, now a children's author, took the world by storm in the 90s as Ginger Spice with the Spice Girls. For a brief period in her childhood, she was a Jehovah's Witness. In her autobiography, If Only, Jerry writes, Although she had been raised as a Catholic, my mother joined the Jehovah's Witnesses when I was very young. She never gave a reason, although I suspect she felt lonely and wanted to escape my father. Clutching my favourite toys, Yellow Ted and Black Dolly Pippa, I sat through the endless sermons at the Kingdom Hall and learned Bible stories like Jonah and the Whale. Afterward, small groups stepped out to spread the word. From door to door, to teach to preach, they sang. I stood on the doorstep, clutching my mother's hand. 
Nobody ever wanted to invite us inside, and some of them were quite rude. The Jehovah's Witnesses didn't celebrate birthdays or Christmas, which is pretty difficult for a child to understand. Parties and presents matter at that age. I didn't go to friends' birthday parties because I didn't have a gift to give them. Look. Ah, oh, look at you, mother. I know. Sexy thing. Who's that? <laughs> oh my god, that's when I was about 16, 17. Look, little ginger girl. Yeah, we're, not, we're not using that picture. <laughs> Her mother eventually left the witnesses, saying, My expectations were too high. They were a bunch of hypocrites who were just as materialistic and greedy as the rest of us. Jerry's been quoted as feeling very relieved to have left. Since then, she's tested out a few different faiths, including Scientology, but prefers not to commit to any single one and is content to simply be spiritual. I think, for me, religion is different flavors of ice cream to get to the same thing, and I'd be down with anybody who wants to pursue some sort of spirituality in their life. I need it, particularly in this industry, which can be incredibly the opposite of that. You almost need a black belt in spirituality. You don't understand, Prince. I have wanted to make love to you for my whole life. Sherry Shepard is an American TV personality, actress, author, and comedian, probably best known as co-host of The View for seven years. Her family converted to Jehovah's Witnesses when she was a teenager, and she said that the religion destroyed her family. She found witness policies to be strict and overbearing, leading her to leading a double life. One life going to the Kingdom Hall, going out in field service, and another being just Sherry. Things began to fall apart when she lost her virginity. She wrote about it in her diary, which her sister snooped into, told her mother, and their mother told the elders. I got in trouble <laughs> uh, being a Jehovah's Witness when I lost my virginity. I remember the elders um, questioned me for probably two and a half to three they, hours. They, they, they questioned you? They questioned you? me. It was three older men. Well, how did they find out that you lost your virginity? Girl, because my sister read my diary. Oh, gosh. Took my diary, the pages, tore them out, and took them to my mother. And she took them to the elders. It was very traumatic because I was a young teenager, and my mm -hmm. father, they had my father sit there. Oh, gosh. And that was really traumatic to be questioned by three very old men in the congregation about losing something that was so beautiful that I thought at the time... Um, to be questioned over and over and over in front of your dad. It was humiliating. It was That was one of the things that, that just kind of made me shy away. Her father was never fully on board with witness theology. He was known to ask question after question about their beliefs and policies, even after becoming baptized. After Sherry was put on public reproof, one question became one too many, and her father was disfellowshipped. She and her sisters were told that they could no longer speak with him, even at the house. My dad worked as a waiter at Denny's in the suburbs of Chicago, where they were very prejudiced. And we walked in, and my two sisters told him, we can't talk to you anymore. And I remember my father breaking down, crying, because that was his second job. And he worked three to take care the of The church us. was telling you you couldn't... They told us we could not could talk, not to, talk my dad, to your own father? To my own father. So we had to, like, not talk to him in the house. And to see my father break down and cry. And I think mm -hmm. that kind of was the last straw, because I felt... In the Bible, it says the greatest of these things is love. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me that the man that I love, who's like giving everything to take care of me, I can't talk to. Like, I can't have anything to do with my dad. This led to her parents getting a divorce, and Sherry was estranged from her father until she left the religion. A number of factors contributed to her leaving, of course, being cut off from her father. She says that she was also told she couldn't pursue stand-up comedy as it was taking away from time from her church activities. Ultimately, though, it was the loss of her mother, whose death left Sherry feeling lost and alone, still forbidden from talking to her father, that she broke down and left the witnesses to reunite with her father and join a black Pentecostal church. Things weren't always so rosy, though. Old habits as a witness eventually came back to get her, resulting in her arrest. I was in jail for eight days. I don't know. Okay, understand. for what? <laughs> 
Oh, because, oh, girl, <laughs> I was in jail for eight days because I had traffic warrants. I had $10,000 uh, worth of traffic warrants. LA don't play that. They don't play because yeah. my registration was two years expired because I was Jehovah's Witness. And we had been taught that the end of the world was coming. And I was like, well, since the end of the world was coming, why am I paying my bills? So I didn't pay any bills. So when I would get traffic warrants and when I would get tickets for my reg registration being expired, I was like, but Jesus is coming. I mean, so that's why how I, I feel about my bills. Trump is president. Why am I paying my Thank bills? Thank you. Why you go to Casual Corner and shop? Why do I pay off my why you paying your bills? Die? The apocalypse yeah. is coming. <laughs> While she describes her first visit at a black Pentecostal church as a terrifying experience, you go to a Pentecostal church, it's a like, yeah. she was astounded to find that worship could be a joyous experience and considers herself saved by God from Jehovah's Witnesses to become a Christian. English supermodel and actress Naomi Campbell was raised a Jehovah's Witness by her mother and grandmother. Naomi never knew her father, who abandoned her mother when she was just four months pregnant, so Naomi took on the last name of her mother's second marriage. It's unclear if her biological father was a witness as well. Leaving behind her beliefs when her modeling career took off at age 15, Naomi hasn't spoken much on her religious upbringing, though her mother, still a devout witness, has spoken about it at length. Valerie Campbell told Vogue in 2003, I brought Naomi up as a Jehovah's Witness, but she must choose her faith for herself. I do give her literature on the subject, though, when she asks for it. Her mother did not want her to go into modeling originally, but has come to support Naomi's career as time went on and has even done some modeling herself. In an interview with You Magazine in 2019, Valerie said that Naomi has offered to pay for her to have reconstruction surgery after losing her breasts in her battle with breast cancer. She chooses to wear a prosthesis instead while waiting for paradise. One day I will be resurrected and this old body will turn to dust anyway. Interestingly, Naomi hosted a live chat with current Jehovah's Witnesses, Serena and Venus Williams. The Williams sisters talked about how they always followed and copied what their older sisters were doing growing up, to which Naomi asks if that goes for the religion they follow as well. In the terms of the Jehovah's Witness, I grew up with my, my grandmother, my mothers. So is that an old aspect, Serena, that you followed your big sister, Venus? Yeah, definitely. But religion is a completely different subject. You have to kind of find your own way in that. And you just follow the example. Legendary singer, songwriter, author, and beat generation poet Patti Smith was raised as a Jehovah's Witness by her mother. Her father, an inquisitive agnostic, enjoyed engaging in religious debate and lit a passion in Patti for reading, asking questions, and exploring other faiths. Pause for full disclosure here. While researching for this video, it had to be noted that Patti Smith is somewhat of an unreliable narrator. Many of her stories conflict. Sometimes her dad was a staunch atheist, other times he's agnostic, and sometimes he just, he was religious. The age she was when she left changes, and a few stories about being a witness, she talked about hell and going to heaven, which isn't in line with what witnesses actually believe at all. But perhaps, she was trying to speak in layman's terms to avoid explaining witness theology in an interview with Rolling Stone. You can see clearly on this page that we have a surplus of $4,300. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we have to spend that by the end of the day or it will be deducted from next year's budget. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? I don't know, but you know what? She's lived a long life and had a lot of fun, so you do you, Patty. You do you.
With that said, here is what's consistent in all of her stories. She grew up peddling Watchtower and Awake magazines until it became clear to her that the organization was going to make her choose between the religion and her art. And they told her that if she did not have the religion, she could not have a relationship with God. Well, if that was the trip and the only way you could get to God was through religion, then I didn't want him anymore. I was just outside and there was this huge storm brewing. I was standing outside and I was sick, sick of being Jehovah's Witness because they said there was no place for art in Jesus' world. I said, well, what's going to happen with the museums, the Modiglianis, the Blue Period? She left and after some years of exploring other faiths, decided to practice her spirituality through her art, still scoffing at the idea that she needs to be beholden to a religion to have a relationship with God. Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. In an interview with Rolling Stone magazine on her song for Darren Aronofsky's Noah, she said, My sister is still Jehovah's Witness. We talk all the time. I like to keep abreast of what she's doing and what she believes in. I believe there is good in all religions. But religion, politics, and business, all of these things have been so corrupted and so infused with power that I really don't have interest in any of it. Governments, religion, corporations. But I do have an interest in the human condition. Interesting bit of trivia, Patti Smith never read or responded to her fan mail. Instead, her Jehovah's Witness mother took care of it and responded to each one. In the 80s, when Patty found herself a gay icon in the midst of the AIDS crisis, her mother found herself offering support and acting as a mother figure to thousands of gay people sending their letters in. My mother would sort of adopt them. My mom would say, well, you need motherly advice, like me. And people were loyal to her for 80 years. I mean, she had people writing to her um, for 15, 20 years, the same people, you know, who went on, who started, you know, maybe with a little drug problem or maybe having some troubles and she took them to counsel and then they became, you know, bank managers or, you know, whatever, you know, but um, she did a lot to help people, a lot of people when they lost their companions uh, through the, uh, the height of the AIDS crisis, writing to my mother for comfort. And she stayed that when she could, they would come visit her. And sometimes somebody would be, you're actually dying, and what, what they would want to do, they would make pilgrimages to, to spend with my mom. Really? And if I could go home, at the time we're not visitors. But they were really, uh, they had evolved way past, past me. And it's really my mom that we're going to see, because she had like shown them so love and concern because I never listened to letters. Yeah. You know, at the time she thought to these people, um, you know, listening to their problems or giving advice, sending them, you know, my mother was a Jehovah Witness, so sometimes she would send them scriptural advice or a watchtower in the wake or something. Okay. But most of the time, it was just heartfelt. A vital element in keeping the peace is our military establishment. Our arms must be mighty, ready for instant action, so that no potential aggressor may be tempted to risk his own destruction. Our military organization today bears little relation to that known of any of my predecessors in peacetime. Dwight Eisenhower served as a five-star general in the U.S. Army during World War II and one day became the 34th president of the United States with vice president and future president of Watergate proportions, Richard Nixon. Before all of that, and you heard it right, Eisenhower was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. Well, sort of. The religion as it was known then was referred to as Russellites, or Bible students, before taking on the name Jehovah's Witnesses in 1931, after several schisms and long after Dwight left. His mother, Ida, was originally a Lutheran, but joined the River Brethren after marrying David Jacob Eisenhower, whose father was a pastor for the Mennonite sect. 
That lasted until 1895 when Dwight's brother died from a bacterial disease. This devastated the Eisenhowers who found little comfort until some nice Russellite women arrived with the promise that their son would soon be resurrected. Many claim that each of its parts is more helpful than a year in college, or the four parts equal to four years or more. At the time, Russellites believed that the new system and resurrection would arrive by 1914, giving the Eisenhowers hope that they would soon be reunited with their son. They sold them a set of their books, Millennial Dawn, a subscription to Zion's Watchtower, and it wasn't long before the Eisenhowers left the River Brethren to become Bible students, the sect that would one day become Jehovah's Witnesses. Ida became incredibly zealous in the faith to the point that the family actually hosted watchtower meetings in their home for 20 years until their local community grew big enough to rent a watchtower meeting house, now known as a kingdom hall. David Eisenhower conducted the meetings while the boys took turns reading from the watchtower publication. Dwight says that he read the Bible completely through twice before he was 18. Their family home featured an enormous chart of Charles Taze Russell's pyramidology, predicting the last days, end of the world, and paradise as featured in Millennial Dawn, and a core belief of the sect at the time. Dwight Eisenhower left the faith when he became of age, as many witness kids do, but the indoctrination heavily influenced him for the rest of his life. While he eventually became baptized as a Presbyterian after being elected president, he said that he preferred the informal church service like he grew up with, and swore into presidential office on an American Standard Bible because it used Jehovah for God. What's interesting is that there are very few quotes from Dwight about Jehovah's Witnesses because they largely tried to bury their involvement with the sect. His father became a vocal apostate after 1914 came and went without the promised paradise. Most of the writing about the Eisenhowers washes their involvement out, preferring to associate him with the River Brethren rather than Jehovah's Witnesses. Even the moment he swore into presidential office on a Bible saying, Blessed is the nation whose God is Jehovah, the word Jehovah was removed by the press and substituted with Lord. Their mother died as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, but for the rest of the family, it was something of an embarrassment. This could be for a number of reasons, foremost being that Jehovah's Witnesses were not a very well-liked religion at the time, known entirely for their failed prophecies, hatred of other religions, and disdain for government and military in a time when America was involved in two world wars, and patriotism was at an all-time high. Young men who have not yet done their share must now come forward to help carry the burden. May the memory of what the American fighting man has accomplished renew in us a high resolve to see the job through. Seeing as how Dwight ran for president on his service in the army, it makes sense that he would want to detach as much as possible from the religion that was known as seditionists and worse than traitors. Shut up! When I tell you to do something, you do it. I say move, you move. I say stop, you stop. I say jump, what do you say? You first. Ah! You don't like the rules. I toss your ass back in the pit right now. You understand? Michelle Rodriguez is an actress you'll know from things like the Fast and the Furious films and the Lost TV show. Jehovah's Witnesses will be especially shocked at the flagrant apostasy she displayed in playing the role of Smurf Storm in the 2017 Smurf movie. Lost Village? <laughs> You're the ones who are lost, not us. Michelle grew up in what Jehovah's Witnesses call a split house, with a strict witness mother and an unbelieving father that focused on his career in the military. Witnesses have very strong views on political neutrality and refusing military service, which likely caused a lot of strife in the family until her parents eventually divorced. Michelle left the religion as an adult. When she became an actress, she says most of her friends were really happy for her, some were jealous, while her Jehovah's Witness mother wasn't very happy at all, saying that they're using you and that she's part of the devil's tool. Speaking with the highly originally titled Interview Magazine, she described how growing up in a religion that taught her the world was deceitful gave her a cynical perspective of the world. I hated school right away. 
Religion had a lot to do with it because I felt like everyone was always lying to me. And then I heard that the guy who invented the Jehovah's Witnesses was a Mason. Hmm. <laughs> that kind of turned me off. She's been candid in the past about the religion scarring her for life as she described it to Atlanta. In an episode of the Estefan's Red Table Talk, Michelle talked about coming out as bisexual and what her relationship with the witness side of her family is like with all of that considered. Well, my family is Jehovah Witness. <laughs> That's a whole other table. I mean, birthdays and, Hall and celebrating Halloween are like evil. I didn't get to watch Disney movies till I was in my teens. Oh, you know? Wow. Like because of all the witchcraft. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. Wow. So that's a whole other ball of wax there. Wow, Michelle. Are you close to your family? You know, my family, I think at the end of the day, they, they set aside the differences. But as far as spending lots of time with that side of the family, it just won't. No. I grew up knowing that you're in this alone. Your mom gives birth to you and your family takes care of you. But... In a sense, you have to make your own in the world. And, and for me, to have other people decide what that looks like, it was, I was like, I could never, I could never live that life. Since leaving Witnesses, she dated a Muslim man, but ultimately ended the relationship when he began to assert his religious views over her. We got on fine and he respected me until it came around to a marriage proposal. He then listed all the things he wanted me to do like cover up my body and show nothing but my eyes. He said, your body is for me and my pleasure. I told him, I thought you knew by now that nobody rules me. I've had a few problems getting mixed up with controlling characters who seem to find me a challenge because I'm a free spirit. She took a brief sabbatical from acting to take a spiritual journey that led her from Mongolia to Peru and Mexico, trying to find balance in spirituality that comes from within rather than from, presumably, organizations of men telling her what to do. You are the wildest, most gorgeous thing I've ever seen. Nobody deserves you, but at least I know our children will be beautiful. Luke Evans is a Welsh singer and actor playing in films like The Hobbit, The Fast and the Furious, and that really disturbing naked blood transfusion scene in Ma. He grew up knocking on doors as a Jehovah's Witness. He recalls, I hated it, if I'm honest, not least because I was bullied at school. There were times when we knocked on the homes of the parents of children who bullied me at school. You'd see kids sat in front of the box having their cereals, doing what I wanted to be doing on a Saturday morning. I don't blame my parents or their religion, but I hated it. I absolutely hated it. There were streets I wouldn't walk down in case the bullies were there. I wouldn't play out in the evening with my friends. I'd go half an hour out of my way to avoid those streets. Then I'd have to stand on a bully's doorstep in a suit with my parents behind me on a Saturday morning. That's not what you want to do as a kid. He's not always so harsh on the religion, however, citing the experience of rejection at the door and public speaking as things that have helped him later in life. It's quite a strict upbringing and you know, we um, knock doors on the weekends and uh, it's, you get a lot of doors slammed in your face. And it's quite, a, it's quite an experience for a young child to experience that, but uh, I am, Truly, you know, I've got thick skin now. It's as an actor, I, uh, it worked in my favor, really. We had, we had some people that listened, and so it was, uh, it was some interesting. Yes. So you never had a birthday? No, my first birthday was when I was 18. And I had the, like, the guilt, even though I hadn't been a witness for like two years, this strange, you know, thinking, oh God, this is weird. You call Christmases or Easter or... I no, they don't so celebrate much. any of the, f of the kind of celebrations. No, no, because a lot of Did they mind that you left? I think they were a little worried because I was so young. I was like 16 when I left home. But you I was... You at 16 mm, to, to pursue to, acting or just no, you just, to get just out of to it. get out. Just, I felt like I was ready and I was itching mm. to just get on with my life. And... An out gay man, he was awarded Man of the Year in 2020 by Attitude magazine, but faced some criticism in the gay community by people who felt that he was pushing himself back into the closet. 
and hiding his sexuality as his fame grew. In response, he said, I just wanted to get online and I wanted to pick up the phone and say, do you realize? I left home at 16 because I was gay. I went into the world as a kid because I had to. This, of course, was the same year that he left Jehovah's Witnesses, and it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure out why that is. As with lots of parents, it was difficult for them to understand. And I think the religion is also a difficult thing with added pressure. But it took time, and it took respect, and patience, and understanding, and acceptance of each other, which doesn't come overnight. It was a very scary thing. He's now focused on building his career and being a vocal advocate against bullying. He said, If a bullied kid reads this article and sees that someone like me went on to play those quintessential masculine characters, well, maybe that shows you don't have to let it affect you. That bully is only one person you will meet out of thousands in your life. I'm not done with you yet. This is America. Guns in my area. My area. I got the strap. I gotta carry him. You may know Donald Glover best as one of the stars of the sitcom community, young Lando Calrissian in Solo, Simba in The Lion King, or you may simply know him as Childish Gambino. He's written for 30 Rock, directed for Atlanta, done stand-up comedy, you name it, he's done it, and before all of that, he was a Jehovah's Witness. Their mother forbade all television but PBS, animal shows, and slavery documentaries. Their father occasionally let them watch Bugs Bunny cartoons and Bill Murray movies. The New Yorker reports that he would secretly turn the television on with a sound low and tape episodes of The Simpsons on his Talkboy recorder so that he and his brother could listen to them later. When asked about his experience as a witness, he said, being a Jehovah's Witness was interesting. I think it amplified my own alienness. I was always the odd one out, and Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate Christmas, you don't say the Pledge of Allegiance, and when you have Jewish kids in the class who don't celebrate Christmas, everyone understands, but when you say you're a Jehovah's Witness, they say, so you come to my door at 9 a.m. and wake my family up. I don't understand any of your rules. As a kid growing up in the South, people didn't know what it was. It gave me a very different perception of what religion is because in the South, everyone is a Southern Baptist. Jehovah's Witnesses are Christian, but it felt small and almost cult-like in Atlanta. I didn't have a lot of things growing up, like a lot of things from the world. Like the, the, I was always taught like the world was kind of a bad place. So like whenever things came in, I'd be like, yo, this is really dope. Yeah, I think all the little things that a lot of people get when they're younger were really fascinating to me when I was old. So he was asked if the constraints of being a Jehovah's Witness pushed him to be more creative and artistic. He said, I believe it made me see the world differently. Part of the religion is teaching you that the world is an evil place, so trying to reconcile really liking stuff in the world, but also being told it's bad makes you want to figure it out. What is this? And why am I being drawn to this? My creative outlet was definitely shaped by being a Jehovah's Witness. He actually played a Jehovah's Witness on the show Community. Well, a loose adaptation on what a Jehovah's Witness is anyway. Cause I am Jehovah's most secret witness, so I might have to dedicate my life to Christmas and act just like I love it till the day I die. The character actually did a lot on the show that would be outright forbidden to a normal witness. When asked about the discrepancies, he explained, I think he's not as Jehovah's Witness as he wants to be. Am I Jehovah's Witness or are my parents Jehovah's Witness? I think everybody kind of hits that point where they say, okay, am I doing this out of tradition? Do I actually believe this? Troy is that kind of witness, trying to find a way to live in the real world as much as possible and perhaps secretly question what he's being told. It's unclear if Donald was ever baptized as a witness, but his parents don't shun him and remain supportive if a bit weary of his impressive career. How do feel about like, the, the, the job you do now? Is that okay with, uh, with the, the, the strictures of being witness? I think, no. No. <laughs> but they must still be very proud of you. I mean, no, they're, very, they're the best parents ever. Like, they're really good. I was talking to them last night, like, and they're, they're super proud of me. I, I think when it first started, they just didn't know what I was doing. Like, it must have been so, I think about it, it must have been so weird for them. 
to like come to like plays and I'm like, I'm doing this play where like, you know, there's this magician and he does this and then the clan member comes out and then, then, then and they're like, all right, you know, kind of thing. We love you. In his song, Won't Stop, he raps that he's an airport atheist, only pray when there's turbulence, if that gives you any idea as to his current views on spirituality. Of course, what would this video be without addressing the elephant in the room, the Jackson family? This family's Jehovah's Witness background is no secret, especially to those raised in the religion. Mother to the family, Catherine Jackson, was baptized in 1963 and raised all of the children as witnesses, though her husband Joseph never converted. Michael Jackson was active throughout his early career, donning disguises to avoid recognition in the door-to-door -door work, which he participated in even on tour. He was a witness when he released the Thriller video, which was very controversial among witnesses. He received criticism from his elders before it was even released, driving Michael to order his manager, John Bronco, who had the only copy of the film, to destroy it. I got a call from Michael one day while the video was being cut, and he, and, uh, he said, Branko, we need to destroy the Thriller video. I said, Michael, what? Why? Apparently, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and at the time Michael was a member of the church, were putting pressure on him, saying the video promoted demonology, <laughs> and it concerned Michael. Bronco was able to persuade Michael into including a disclaimer at the opening of the video that he does not endorse a belief in the occult, which saved Thriller from the cutting room floor. For a while, I had the canisters of film sitting at my office, and Michael would call up every day, Branca, did you destroy the tapes? Well, Mike, you know, let's talk about this a little more. And, you know, day after day, the phone call would come in. And I was a big fan of horror movies. I said, Michael, do, do you ever see Dracula? Bela Lugosi? Yeah. Well, you know, he's a very religious man. And um, very religious. But it's a role that he plays. Oh. So that's how we sort of eased into the idea of putting the disclaimer on the, uh, the video. Despite this, Jehovah's Witnesses extracted an apology out of him for an issue of their magazine Awake, where he said, I would never do it again, and I realize now that it wasn't a good idea. He disassociated from the religion in 1987 when his sister Latoya was disfellowshipped and he refused to shun her. Despite leaving, it appears he continued believing in core witness theology for some years afterward, often quoting their teachings in interviews and remembering his years of door-to-door -door work fondly. And the way we were raised and the values my father instilled in us as youth, and uh, she was always there with the Bible, teaching us. We'd go to, you know, service all the time, like four times a week. Um, and. Uh, I'm so glad we did that because um, those values are very important. I don't know if I, I could have done as well without them. He did, however, express some regret after Elizabeth Taylor surprised him with his very first Christmas celebration. At the same time, it's exciting. I felt guilty, too, at the same time. I remember going in the bathroom crying later because I felt I had done something wrong because I was raised not to ever celebrate it. He held extravagant Christmas celebrations at Neverland Ranch ever since. For a more in-depth look at Michael Jackson and how Jehovah's Witnesses impacted his life, check out my other video, Michael Jackson in the Doomsday Cult. He explored other faiths in the last decade of his life, and there are some rumors that he converted to Islam shortly before dying, but there is no confirmation of this. After his death, Catherine was granted custody of his children Paris, Prince Michael I, and Prince Michael Jr., who continued in the faith. 
In 2013, it was reported that Paris and Prince Michael resented doing witness activities and stopped doing them. Paris has since launched a music career of her own, and the brothers have started a YouTube channel called Film Family. Judging by the length of his hair, it can be assumed that Prince Michael Jr. has also left the faith. Good on you, bud. The only remaining family members in the faith are Catherine Jackson and Rebby, whose husband is an elder. There are many, many more where that came from, but sadly, we are out of time for today. If you like this video and you want to see more about Jehovah's Witnesses, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button so you don't miss any of my videos. Thank you for watching and take care, everybody. Thanks to Linda Turner, Sean Smith, Bob Jamin, Leica Fox, and all my supporters on Patreon who made this video possible. If you'd like to join them in supporting my channel, visit patreon.com slash mentally diseased.